Welcome to the online broadcast ministry of Crossroads Church. Pastor Boone has another real-time message designed with you in mind. So grab a pen and download our online worship map and let God's word encourage your heart. Prepare to be blessed. entitled Sharp Right. And if you're a last minute driver, you know what a sharp right is. It's when you make the absolute last moment opportunity to take a right hand turn. That's a sharp right. You know that person, that one person that everybody drives with and you might be that one person. Where if the exit is coming up, three miles out, you don't get off then. You wait, and you wait, and you make everybody nervous in the car. Like, you, you gonna get over? You gonna get over? And then eventually you go from one extreme to the exit. We've all either sat in that car, we've all either driven that car, or we've all either watched that car come straight to us. But every now and again in life, you've gotta take a sharp right. You've gotta stop instantly and turn around. Because you may not have another opportunity to make that turn. And sometimes when you make a sharp right, things fall apart. Usually when I'm making a quick stop or a quick turn, if you're a driver, you normally, if there's a passenger with you that you're married to, you normally reach the hand over real quick because you know they're going forward a little bit. And so you brace it because you don't want to hear about it later. So you, you stretch over and you reach and you try to prevent them from falling. If, if there's coffee, if the phone's on the dashboard, you know it's going to slide into the other end. You pray the window's closed. Because if it catches traction, to fly out. So you try to scatter and hold on to as much as you possibly can. Because when you make a sharp right, things shake. Things got to shift. Because all of a sudden, the direction you were going, you're no longer going. So you're going to lose some things. You might lose some people. You might stop going to some places. Because now I'm making a sharp right. And the direction that I'm going to is no longer the direction I was on. And in this life, we've got to make sharp turns. In this life, there are going to be times when you, don't, when you can't think about it. When you can't plan it out right. When the decision at hand is just so necessary that you have to make it. Amen? And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about Paul's conversion. Because that was as sharp a right-hand turn as there ever been. And so our text is going to be coming from Acts chapter 9. And we're going to read from verses 1 through 19. And it says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. So that if he found anyone who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell on the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. He said, I am Jesus who you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he had opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, 
and did not eat anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In the vision he's seen a man named Ananias come to the place come and place his hand on him to restore his sight. Lord Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with the authority from the chief priests to arrest all those that call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Amen. Our first point is that sometimes we've got to make a sharp right because we're running hard in the wrong direction. See, this was the thing with Saul. Saul was type A. He was, he was the epitome of type A. He was a, a case study of type A. Whatever he put his mind to, that's what Saul accomplished. He ran hard, at, but the problem was Saul was going in the wrong direction. See, he was a Pharisee, and he studied, and he was, he was supposed to be this great religious man. But he was going in the wrong direction. And you see, Paul was was there when, when, when Stephen was martyred. The first martyr of Christ, Paul kind of, Saul gave his approval for. And from that day to the day that we're reading, all he did was breed out threats. This is what he did. This is who he was. You ever been around somebody that sucks the air out the room? Whether they're, they're just so negative that they just... You walk in the room and you just, oh man, it's, you wish you could leave. You wish somebody didn't pick your phone up. Because now you got to talk to them. And that's who Paul was. Murder was his atmosphere. This is what he was. This is what he did. And he moved. And as he moved, he persecuted. And Damascus is some three to four day journey. And he was persecuting all the way to Damascus. It's not something that stopped. It's not something that was interrupted. He wasn't happy with the Christians just being kicked out of Jerusalem. Because that's what they did after Stephen was murdered. Everybody scattered. Aside from the apostles. And he wasn't happy with them leaving Jerusalem. He wanted them off the face of the earth. And so he went to the chief priest. And the chief priest was a Sadducee. So they weren't even like, they shouldn't even be together. They were opposing views. Sadducees and Pharisees had opposing religious views. They didn't even get along but for this moment. The enemies of the Lord are always united. It's the people of God that got to get together. Because the enemies of the Lord are always united. They put aside their differences in the pursuit of Christians. Amen. We got to do better. We got to love stronger. We just got to do better. Our enemy is united. We got to do better. We got to lift up each other more. We got to love each other harder. We got to do better because we have a unified enemy. And so now Paul is, Saul is on his way. And the Bible says that as he was getting there, right before he got to there, he was interrupted. You see, God has a way. If you want him to, he'll interrupt you. You may choose not to believe, but it's not going to be because he didn't try to reach out to you. You may reject him, but it's not going to be because he didn't reach out. It's not going to be because somebody didn't pray. It's not going to be because somebody didn't invite. 
It's because you refuse to turn. And so Paul had this opportunity to turn because he was going the wrong direction. And so sometimes we got to realize that, look, even if I'm running hard, I may not be going in the direction that I need to go. And so I might have to just take a sharp right. And so our second point is we have to be willing to leave our plans to follow God's plan. And verse 6 says, the Lord said, basically, there was the Lord speaking to Paul, Saul, and he says, Now get up and go to the city, and you will be told what you must do. It takes humility to change a plan around. So often, our pride keeps us on a wrong road. Because I've already told everybody this is what I'm doing. And I can't change now, because if I change now, that might mean that I wasn't sure the first time. And God forbid you not think I'm sure all the time. God forbid you not think I'm perfect. So I'd much rather crash this car than turn it around because I already told Doug I was going this way. And I already convinced him to come with me. So God forbid me to say now that, you know what, Doug, we're going the wrong way. So I'm going to drive anyhow. You see, Saul had a plan. He was a man with plans. He went to the Sadducees. He got the letters. He said, let's persecute them. It was systematic. It wasn't just vicarious. It was systematic. He says, they're in this synagogue in Damascus. And they were there because a lot of Jewish refugees were there. So he knew where they were. He targeted them. He was going there. The Bible said that Ananias said, Paul is on his, that guy Saul is on his way with letters. He announced it. Everybody knew he was coming. This was well planned and well orchestrated. And the Lord tells him, go to Damascus and I'll tell you what to do when you get there. The Lord doesn't even give him a plan. God forbid some of us won't get out of bed without a plan. Now we lose the phone, that's it. Got to shut it down because I don't know what to do next. And sometimes it requires a little flexibility and less, less rigidness. It doesn't mean we shouldn't plan, but understand that sometimes that plan just goes to the wind. And when that happens, you've got to be able to trust God. But it takes some humility. It takes some humility to realize, first of all, you're going the wrong direction. And after you realize that, it takes even more humility to say, well, maybe your direction is better. Because that's basically what the Lord told him. He says, all right, still go to Damascus. Right city, wrong plan. So we're still going to Damascus. But when you get there, I will have somebody tell you what to do. Paul was a, Saul was a man of authority. Now you think about it. He marched his way to the chief priest's house. He got these letters together. This was a man of religious authority. Jesus Christ isn't even giving him instructions. He's telling them, go and I'm going to have somebody give you instructions. Paul's probably, Saul's probably never got instructions his whole adult life. There are some people that haven't got instructions their whole adult life. They've been the man from about 20. And he's about 30-something, 40-something, and God said, well, I got somebody for you. Just, they're going to tell you what to do. But we got to humble ourselves. We got to be able to humble ourselves before God because he's still God. I was coming home with my daughter, and we're having a conversation, and there was something I told her she had to do, and I thought it was a good idea. And, you know, as a parent, a good idea means this is what we're doing. We're just saying it nicely. And so I said, look, this is what we're going to do. And she said, you know what, Daddy, I don't want to do this. But they're old enough to where I want them to develop. And I, we're raising a young lady. I'm not raising a girl. So I wanted to start to reason. I wanted to start to think. So I asked her, okay, if you don't want to do that, what do you want to do? And she didn't have an answer. I said, well, uh, I don't know. I just don't want to do this. I said, well, this is what we're doing. Because, and then she asked her, why do I have to do what you say? I said, well, because I'm the parent. And sometimes that's how it is with God. He's just God. And so some things are open to debate and some things aren't. He's God. He created the universe. He created me. He created you. He knows what's best for me. And so sometimes what's best for me may not be what I like. But that doesn't make him less God. 
And since he's God, he should be obeyed whether I like it or not. Just like my daughter's going to do what I said we we're going to do. Because it wasn't open for debate. If there was a better thing to do, then we would have done the better thing. But there was not a better, this was the better thing. So it's not open for debate. And sometimes we treat this, this Bible like a suggestion box. And so I'm going to take this one. Okay, yeah, this is this, this good, this good. Uh-uh, no, God ain't really meant that. He didn't mean this one. He meant the other one. And he meant this thing right here. I, I'm good with thou shalt not kill. We ain't killers. I'm good with that. But then God shall not commit. Oh, that was Old Testament, wasn't it, brother? <laughs> that was for the Jews, wasn't it? This is not a suggestion box. It's not a, okay, we could take this one, but let's leave that one. He said no fornication, that means no fornication. No adultery means no adultery. It doesn't mean, well, I'm still his child. And I ain't kill nobody. We don't get to pick what we obey. He's God. And so, if we are to make a right turn, then we've got to first know that sometimes we're going in the wrong direction. Secondly, we've got to understand that we've got to surrender our plans for God's. And thirdly, we've got to be honest enough to know when we're blind. And that's a crazy thing because the scripture said, Saul got up from the ground and when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. Acts chapter 22 tells the story a little bit better of what happened. Paul, in his own words, said, the glory of Christ was so bright that it blinded him. You see, this is the thing. Light is always going to be stronger than darkness. Paul was on a mission to destroy the church. And the light of Christ was stronger than his darkness. And you see, that's the thing about the light of Christ. The light of Christ permanently changes a person. When you've come in contact with the light of Christ Jesus, you leave changed. Paul left blinded, but you leave changed. There's no way to come in contact with Christ Jesus. And I'm not talking about church, and I'm not talking about religion, and I'm not talking about pastors. I'm talking about Jesus. It's impossible to come in contact with Jesus for who he is and see him for who he is and leave unchanged. You cannot. It blinded Paul. The light was so overwhelming, it blinded Paul. The problem is, biggest problem is, spiritual sight is worse than being physically blind. You see, this is the thing. Blind people allow people to lead them. Paul came in the leader of the group. But when he became blind, they said somebody let him. People that are blind will allow you to lead them. The problem with us that see is that we can't get led. Nobody could lead us no way because we can see everything. Blind as a bat, but nobody could lead me. I know everything. I wrote the, 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 the book. It's my name under Timothy. That's me. So nobody could tell me anything. And so Paul, that's what Jesus said about the Pharisees. When they said, are we blind also? He said, if you were blind, your sins could be forgiven. But because you claim to see, keep your sin. Because the blind cry out to the Lord. The, the, the sick cried out to the Lord. When Jesus was walking past, the sick was, was breaking ranks to get through. The blind was screaming because they understood they needed a savior. The problem with us that see is that we don't need a savior. And so how can we be saved without a savior we don't need? And that's the problem with us that see. The blind got it right. They know they need help. They're begging. They know they need help. It's those that don't know they need help that have the bigger problem. Because no one could help them. No one could help them. So thirdly, we've got to be honest enough to know that we're blind. And then lastly, we've got to understand that God has a plan for every life, no matter what the past is. You see, Paul's story, Saul's story 
is a story of amazing grace. It's amazing grace. The guy Ananias was like, look, Lord, I know you got it all, but you know who Saul is. The, 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 we, we hiding right now. The guy you tell me to meet, I'm thinking you blind him on purpose so we could have a good time. Because he can't get us if he's blind. You telling me to restore this joker's sight. But God said, in the word he says, let me find it. Oops, lost the page. There we go. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. God chose Saul. And it wasn't relevant what Saul did before he came in contact with Jesus Christ. This is what grace is. This is what grace is. Saul, the ex-murderer, because he, he partook in murders, whether directly or whether because he sent them to be murderers, their blood was on his hands. He was persecuting. He got letters to persecute men and women. He was no respecter of gender. This was Saul. And Ananias says, God, I think you might have got it wrong. God was like, no, I didn't. This is who I choose. We don't get to choose who God chooses. God gets to choose who he chooses. We get to love him. That's what we get to do. We get the honor of loving God's chosen. We get the honor of supporting God's chosen. We get the honor of helping God's chosen. We don't get to choose who God chooses. We got to love him. All Ananias' job was to do was to go heal his eyes. That's what he sent him to do. Go remove the scales so he could see. And then he took him in eventually and he taught him and he introduced him to the Christian community. That's what our job is as believers. Our job isn't to choose who God chooses. When he brings them in, our job is to love them. Our job is to help get the scales off their eyes. Our job is to take them in, treat them right, and then introduce them to the body of faith. That's what our job is. And we're busy trying to choose who God wants. Mm, not this one. Y'all know what she did, right? Y'all seen what he did, right? That's not our job. Our job is just to love them. That's what our job is. Our job is to go meet them and bring them in. Amen? Amen. And so if we got to make a sharp right, we got to realize first that we can be going in the wrong direction. And it doesn't matter how long you've been on that road, it's still possible that you're going in the wrong direction. After that, we've got we've to surrender our plans for God's plan because God has a plan for us. He does. He has a plan for your life. He said so in Jeremiah. He has a plan for your life. The hair on your head is numbered. Your, nay, your days are written in a book. This isn't vicarious. He has a plan for your life. And then after that, we got to be humble enough to realize that we're blind sometimes because only blind people get led only people that don't know everything get led they're people that you can't tell anything because they know everything even though they know nothing and then lastly lastly we got to understand that there's enough grace for everybody grace wasn't just for my sin grace was for his sin too Grace was for her sin too. We don't get to pick what grace is for. We don't get to pick, well, I'm comfortable with this sinner, but I'm not comfortable with that sinner because I'm comfortable with him because that's my sin. That's my issue, so I'm comfortable with him. I'm not comfortable with this guy here. We don't get to pick that. We don't get to pick that. God's grace is enough for every believer, for every unsaved person to come to him. There's an ocean of grace and it never runs dry. That's what grace is. It is our prayer that today's word encourage your heart, enrich your mind, and refresh your spirit. If Pastor Boone was a blessing to you today, please consider giving an online donation so that Crossroads can continue providing real-life answers for real-life change.